We are very glad today to be hosting Dr. Linda Carlson, who is going to speak with, with us about her work on mindfulness-based cancer recovery and mindfulness interventions for folks with chronic illness and cancer, work she's been doing for over 20 years now. Um, we're going to be going from 12 until 1.30, uh, unless we run out of uh, questions before then, in which case we may end a little early. Um, Dr. Carlson will spot, probably speak until about 1 o'clock. And I would just like to say at the outset, you know, if questions come up uh, as Dr. Carlson is speaking, you could just put them in the question and answer uh, kind of uh, Zoom box at the bottom there. Uh, we will definitely present all of those that we have time for at the end and, um, you know, it helps us to be able to organize them if you put them up as soon as they occur to you. And you'll also have the option at the end to ask spontaneously. So Dr. Carlson uh, is a psychologist uh, who holds the Enbridge Research Chair in Psychosocial Oncology, uh, full professor of psychosocial oncology in the Department of Oncology at the Cummings School of Medicine at the University of Calgary. I inquired uh, about her academic background and was able to find out some details that she probably doesn't share all that often anymore. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, nothing too personal. Uh, but she did her PhD with uh, Dr. Barbara Sherwin at McGill University, studying steroid hormones in memory and healthy elderly men in women estrogen users and non-users, and in men and women with Alzheimer's disease. So has been in what you might consider the psychoneuroimmunology world uh, for many years, going back to her PhD. And then during her postdoc, developed MBCR, the Mindfulness-Based Cancer Recovery Program that she's going to be uh, sharing with us in regards to its development and her many years of research investigating its impact on uh, human health and well-being um, and inflammatory markers, etc. Um, but she developed this as a postdoc uh, with uh, mentorship from Dr. Barry Boltz in psycho-oncology and Dr. Michael Specka, who uh, was one of her partners in many of her early uh, and even until fairly recently uh, research studies on mindfulness of cancer and uh, chronic illness. Um, she's an extremely uh, well published, um, many high impact journals and book chapters. She also uh, published, wrote a patient manual in 2011 with Dr. Michael Specka entitled Mindfulness-Based Cancer Recovery, a step-by-step -step MBSR approach to help you cope with treatment and reclaim your life. And a professional training manual published in 2019 with the second edition in 2017 with Shauna Shapiro entitled The Art and Science of Mindfulness, Integrating Mindfulness into Psychology and the Helping Professions. She's published over 200 research papers and book chapters and instead of going through her whole lengthy plot, I'm going to cut it short there and turn it over to you, Linda. Thank you very much for joining right. us today. And we're really looking forward to your talk. Well, I'm happy to be here. I wish I could be there in person because it's like minus 22 at the moment. Um, and we do too. Uh, yeah, in, it's Celsius. So it's not quite as cold as it would be in Fahrenheit. Um, but I laughed when Rael asked me about my, the title of my PhD, and I said, you're not going to quiz me on that, I hope, which uh, would not be pleasant for anyone. So I'm going to share my slides here, get them going. There we are. Um, so I'm going to talk about mindfulness-based interventions for coping with cancer and chronic illness, and largely I'm going to focus on our research in cancer. I'll start more broadly just by talking about why these kind of approaches are useful for acute and chronic illness more generally. And then I will talk about the MBCR program, describe it, some of the early research, and then I'm gonna skip ahead 10 or so years and talk about some of the more recent clinical trials um, that we finished, and then give you an overview of the current studies that are underway. So I will try to only talk for an hour or so, but I've got lots of, lots of good slides. I'm a lover of slides, so graphs. 
Um, so mindfulness-based interventions for people with acute and chronic illness. Uh, I, I'm not doing a lot of the intro, what is mindfulness? I presume that this is a fairly uh, well-informed crowd, but why would it be useful for people with chronic illness? And so what really is the central feature characterizing various forms of chronic illness? It's this sense of loss of control. So we've got our spider talking to the psychiatrist. My life's a mess, doc. You gotta help me. I just seem to be spinning out of control. I mean, that's funny for the spider, but it's not so funny if you're the person whose life has all of a sudden taken a, a right turn or an about face and all the plans you have are suddenly thrown up into the air. So we talk about loss of control as a central feature of the illness experience. Um, with that goes the life threat um, of many illnesses, cancer included, that makes a person have to think about their mortality in a more direct kind of face-to-face -face way, perhaps for the first time. We all know we're gonna die, of course, but it's you know the sort of big thing in the future. Having to actually face it in a more concrete way is, uh, can be very uh, difficult. And there's this loss of certainty. So with loss of control also goes loss of certainty, loss of routine, loss of predictability. Um, you know, We kind of have an idea in our head of how the life's gonna play out, we'll retire, we'll do all these things. Um, well, this calls all that into question and how your life is gonna turn out is really and if you have to go under some treatment for your illness, um, your routine, your income can all be thrown into the air. So there's all sorts of feelings that go with these sorts of transitions, grief, fear, anger, depression. There can be shame, um, you know, feelings of self-blame. There's also symptoms depending on what illness you're coping with. Pain can be very common or fatigue, uh, difficulty sleeping is um, really ubiquitous for people with a variety of medical conditions. When we're talking about cancer, and sort of anything that flares up or that progresses, there's a fear of recurrence or a fear of progression. So even if the prognosis might be good, you know, there's always this idea in the back of your mind, well, what if it comes back or that ache or that pain or that symptom I have, what is, is this telling me that this disease is coming back? And so there's this chronic worry. So I haven't gone through kind of the specifics around mindfulness, but we know a lot of the processes and skills and attitudes that we train people in in a mindfulness program really help address a whole wide range of these experiences. So emotion regulation, you know, helps us identify and tolerate the difficult emotions, um, accepting them, accepting our situation. Doesn't mean you have to like it, but accepting and seeing clearly where we're at. Uh, Non-attachment or really uh, recognizing the constant certainty of change, letting go of the need to try and control things that are essentially uncontrollable, and really approaching it with a sense of self-compassion and kindness. So there's so many elements of the mindfulness experience that specifically address the things that make it difficult to have a chronic illness. So I'm just going to give you a really uh, wide taste of all the different areas or the different illnesses in this case that have been studied. Um, with uh, an application of mindfulness-based interventions. So we've got the whole mental health piece, um, pretty much you name the disorder, someone has tried applying mindfulness to it. And the same goes in the physical health realm. You know, so there's lots of research in cardiovascular disease, hypertension, HIV, AIDS, the area I work in, cancer, symptoms like hot flashes, menopausal symptoms, quite a lot of work in irritable bowel. And I'm just highlighting the ones I'm gonna show you kind of meta-analyses of. Um, early work with solid organ transplantation, a lot of work in pain, you name it again, you know, diabetes, fibromyalgia, different pain conditions, headache, migraine, um, some of John Kabat-Zinn's early work in psoriasis, and even, you know, sort of less common diseases like tinnitus. For example, there's, there's applications of mindfulness programs. And of course, you know, the other kinds of mechanistic things people look at in healthy populations sometimes. Um, even like the more um, inflammatory processes and some of the, the sort of peripheral nervous system as well. Um, so this is just sort of a summary of some of the chronic pain research. So there's a lot of burgeoning work in this area um, and chronic pain is just sort of one example. There's 30 randomized controlled trials in this specific meta-analysis that came out in 2016 you know, with over 2,000 individual patients. And in this uh, forest plot here, they've just broken it down into studies that did MBCT, so mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, versus the MBSR model, and other mindfulness-based interventions. And so chronic pain is actually one of the harder conditions to treat with a mindfulness-based intervention. 
Um, and so the overall uh, effect size you're seeing here is about a, a 0.3 or 0.4, I think, uh, what's the number, 0.32, 0.32. You know, so a small, fairly small overall effect size, but showing some benefit um, across different pain conditions. Oops, yeah, so that's just showing you the um, larger effectiveness of MBSR versus MBCT in these studies and then the overall size. Um, and here's another meta-analysis that has looked at what they call somatization disorders. So, you know, physical disorders with a psychological component, which kind of they all are, um, I guess, where the link is not as clear. So it's got fibromyalgia studies here, um, irritable bowel, and sort of mixed populations. And so the work I'll point out in irritable bowel actually has been really uh, promising. We did one study in that area, that's the Zernike one, was one of my students' studies, um, but looking at a pretty large um, overall effect size on improving not just quality of life and coping, but actual symptoms of the condition of irritable bowel is, is improved by these mindfulness-based interventions. Smaller effect size for fibromyalgia and kind of in the middle where we're looking at mixed conditions. All right, so that's all I'm giving you on other um, diseases, but I'm certainly happy to answer questions around that as we get to the Q&A, um, because there is interesting work, for example, HIV cardiovascular disease. But I'm gonna focus on the mindfulness-based cancer recovery um, program and our own research for the rest of the time. So this just sort of shows you a typical group where people are you know, meeting in a circle, and of course now we do it on Zoom, and that actually also works quite well. But a little bit of history. So um, in 1996, my colleagues, Michael Specka, Maureen Angan, and Eileen Goody at the Tom Baker Cancer Center in Calgary were psychologists and social workers who sort of started talking about the fact that they practiced mindfulness and yoga as a form of self-help and coping. And why don't we offer that kind of thing to our patients that we're working with? So they were throwing around ideas about doing a program like this based on their personal yoga and meditation practices. Right around that time, I showed up in 1997, fresh out of my PhD. Actually, I was there for my internship year. Um, and having met John Kabat-Zinn in 1995 and read his book, Full Catastrophe Living, and really being you know, very enthusiastic about mindfulness and yoga, and um, really wanting to do this kind of work in that population. So in 1998, we put together all our ideas, um, we adapted the MBSR program, and we started offering it to cancer patients in our, in our center. And it's been open to cancer patients and family members ever since that time as a free clinical program. We do it in groups of 15 to 20 participants, um, three times a year, and sometimes two or three sessions simultaneously. So anywhere from three to nine groups a year. Um, over the years, we've had well over 3,000 participants, and it's an ongoing clinical program, and we embed the research studies within the ongoing program and often recruit participants from the wait list of that program. So over the years, we renamed it a mindfulness-based cancer recovery in recognition of the fact that it is different from MBSR. Um, and Michael Speck and I wrote this book that is actually a, a patient manual. It's a home study version and it's in a whole bunch of different languages now. I think we've got uh, French, Dutch, Spanish, I don't know what that language is, German I think, and a couple of versions of Chinese and it's in Vietnamese and Korean and all kinds of other, other languages now. So how is our program similar or different from MBSR? Started as an eight week program, now it's nine weeks. Uh, started as about an hour and a half, now we're up to two hour weekly meetings, still shorter than typical MBSR, to one or two instructors. Um, and you know, we have a standard format where we start with a discussion, homework review, um, and our, our topic of the week, you know, um, sort of typical learning around stress response or whatever the topic is. And then we always have mindful yoga followed by different types of meditations that we move through sequentially. So starting with a body scan, sitting in meditation, walking, loving kindness. Um, the typical sort of range of practices. All the participants get a booklet that takes them through week by week, has their homework, includes reading lists, um, and people uh, are required or asked to do home practice every day, and we used to give them CDs, now they have a link to mp3 files that they can stream. They keep track of how much time they spend each week in a homework log, um, and we do have the six-hour silent retreats, usually between week six and seven. So it's a multi-dimensional program. The overarching theme, of course, is mindfulness, training in mindfulness, what is it, um, and really just many different techniques to help us uh, 
cultivate both a formal and an informal practice of mindfulness, so bringing it more into a person's everyday life. We do specifically teach around relaxation, physiological relaxation, how to manipulate the breath, uh, to uh, monitor our level of arousal or, or change our level of arousal. The yoga is actually quite an important component in our program, and so half our practice time is um, gentle yoga, and we just follow the sequence in the original Full Catastrophe Living booklet from John Kabat-Zinn. Uh, we do talk a lot about the mind-body connection, the science of the mind-body connection, and how you know every state of mind is reflected in a physiological or bodily state and vice versa. We teach them visualization and imagery as techniques to enhance mindful qualities that a person might be working on. So we use lake meditations, mountains. And we've also, similar to MBCT, there is a focus on cognitive coping strategies, um, not in a CBT way that your thoughts are wrong and they should be changed, but more an awareness of, okay, um, you know, what are the stories we're telling ourselves about our lives and what's their impact on, you know, how we feel and behave and are there different ways of interpreting the world. And of course, there's an element of personal empowerment. Um, you know, I mentioned that loss of control, that feeling of not being able to um, know what's gonna be happening and plan. And so it gives people something that they can do on their own and something that they can pull out of their pocket when they're in a stressful situation. And because it's done in a group, uh, there's a really a powerful element of social support that I think, um, well, when people tell us, you know, they really value. So these are the typical types of practices. So we see people on the right doing a body scan. You're lying down, bringing awareness from your toes right up to your head or vice versa. We see the fellow sitting in the chair. You know, so often there's a misconception that we have to sit on the floor and you know, wrap our leg around our head and that kind of uh, look like a yogi to do sitting meditation. Most of our participants are older and prefer to sit in a chair. We do walking practice. We do open awareness meditation. I mentioned um, imagery using a mountain or a lake typically, and we also um, do loving kindness practice or metta. So this is to remind me to talk again about the yoga and the central um, position that yoga plays in our program because of the physical nature of the illness and the treatments and how people will have been affected um, both in their body, but also their relationship with their body through the illness experience. So they may have had surgery or chemo or radiation. And so the function of the body is different. And then people may feel a sense of anger, or frustration or betrayal with the body. So um, the embodiment of the practice is a real um, important element to reconnect or refriend, we often say, um, the physical body. All right, so that's a quick uh, introduction of the program. And so now I'm going to just focus on the research results. So if you have any questions about the program itself, I think we can um, save them for afterwards, or I don't know if um, we want to address any now. If we do, Rael can tell me. Um, all right, so I am going to start with the very first study we did, and then I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. So in 1998, we decided to do a randomized weightless controlled cl clinical trial um, and we called it mindfulness meditation based stress reduction because we didn't really know what it was. And we focused on mood and symptoms of stress in cancer patients. So we really took anybody. Um, you know, this was when we were first started the program. Anybody who wanted to come was more than welcome. We managed to get 89 people to sign up. They were on off treatment and we randomly assigned them to the immediate MBSR group or a wait list. And then we followed them all up for six months after they had all done the program. So lo and behold, we found improved symptoms of stress and less mood disturbance. Um, I'm going to show you some of the graphs from that. You know, this was the first study ever published of mindfulness for people with cancer. And so it's become kind of a landmark. You know, we, it, I mean, it's one of my most highly cited papers, over 1,500 citations at this point. Um, and then we also followed them up for six months and showed maintenance of the improvements that they had gained, both in the immediate and the waitlist group when they finally did it. So this just sort of shows you the range of people who were in that first study. Um, so stage one is the least invasive, stage four is a sped a metastatic spread throughout the body. And you can see we had people in each of those groups um, and across a range of different types of cancers. And so our primary outcome was this total mood disturbance on the profile of mood states. Um, and so blue is the mindfulness group and red is the control. Higher scores mean more mood disturbance, so we want them to be lower. And what we saw happen um, pre to post was just a huge decrease, like really big 
Like it was 65% reduction. The effect size was well over one um, in these mood, mood symptoms in the people who did the intervention. And these are the subscales. So big decreases in anxiety, depression, anger, improved sense of vigor, and smaller effects for um, decreasing fatigue and mental confusion. So our other outcome there is called the symptoms of stress inventory. So same idea, higher scores are worse. We saw a decrease in this case, so it was about a 35% reduction in the mindfulness group compared to controls. And it has a bunch of subscales too. So this habitual patterns is more like behavioral responses to stress. So like overeating, smoking, gum chewing, nail biting, um, things like that decreased. A decrease in muscle tension, cardiopulmonary symptoms of stress, feelings of irritability and anxiety again showed up on this one. All right, so that sort of set the stage. And you know, at this point we were like, whoa, like no one had ever looked at this in cancer patients. And the effects were humongous. Like people were telling us it transformed their lives. I mean, we were like, whoa, like we're really onto something. Let's let's continue to investigate this. So I got a postdoctoral fellowship and that's what um, we, we just kept doing. So I'm just gonna summarize over the years, a number of studies we did first focusing on symptomatology and decreasing things like stress. You know, we talked about mood, anger, anxiety, but then focusing in on some of the common symptoms that people with cancer experience like sleep and fatigue. And then we became interested in mechanisms of, you know, how the change was happening. So, of course, looking at things like emotion regulation, rumination, worry, um, and those things did um, mediate the changes we were seeing. And we also looked at the partners who came to the program uh, who were also welcome to attend and found that they improved in a similar way to the patients. Then we also became interested in this idea of not just managing symptoms, but you know, helping people to thrive after a cancer diagnosis and you know, maybe be even better or feel better than they did before. And so looking at things like quality of life, spirituality, post-traumatic growth. So these ideas, these are ideas around uh, feeling connected with something larger than yourself, feeling a sense of meaning and purpose in life, living authentically with your values taking the trauma of a cancer diagnosis and using it as a catalyst to you know, live in a way that maybe you haven't up to this point in your life. Sometimes we just get on automatic pilot and we don't really think about it, but a, a life threat or a traumatic experience can really help people stop and you know, reassess where they are in their life and where they really wanna be going. And then of course, I've been interested in a lot of these biomarkers um, with my background in p and &E and p and i and, I'm going to show you some of the data here um, with the blood pressure and cortisol, um, not as much of the inflammation and telomere length. I'm laughing because I'll tell you why one story there. So over the years, um, after those first few kind of more observational studies, we um, did a bunch of randomized controlled trials that got increasingly more sort of sophisticated. Um, and I'll walk you through a few of those. And I like to give them, you know, catchy names, as you can see. Um, and then some of the ongoing ones, Match One Mind and Seamless, where we're starting to look at pragmatic trials, we're looking at um, online and app-based mindfulness as well. All right, so MASTER, this was Mindfulness in Acute Stress Test Reactivity and Recovery. This is an interesting story because it started back in 2010 and it just finished last year. Um, so it was a, a master's thesis for one of my students, Laura LaBelle, and it was a weightless controlled trial of women with cancer, about 70 some odd of them. And we wanted to do the TRIER social stress test. So many of you I'm sure are familiar with this, but it's an acute laboratory stressor where we bring people in, we hook them up um, and we purposefully uh, subject them to stressful tasks. And we look at um, their cardiovascular and cortisol reactivity to the stressors and then how quickly they recover. Um, so they got the TSST at baseline and then they uh, either did the mindfulness-based cancer recovery program or wait list, they were waiting for it, a post-test, and we also in this study um, did home blood pressure monitoring on a weekly basis. So we sent them home with these monitors and they just, as they did the program or waited for the program, they monitored their blood pressure each week. So that's a picture of one of the stress tasks in the TRIER where people um, have five minutes to prepare a speech on a certain topic and then they get up and deliver the speech to a very unresponsive panel um, who just sort of stares at them blankly. Uh, you know, and, and people feel, of course, people have a fear of public speaking to begin with, and then they feel very criticized. So it very reliably elicits a stress response. You're probably heart, heart's pounding just thinking about it. This is kind of the classic paradigm or protocol. Um, so people come in, you hook them up. We did blood pressure monitoring, um, heart rate, and uh, cortisol reactivity. 
Um, they fill out some questionnaires, they rest, they get the instructions, and then they have the stress procedure. In our case, it was public speaking and then a, and then a mental arithmetic uh, task, which is, I think, sort of tracking sequential sevens or, um, you know, and, you, and it's designed, you do it on a computer to get a certain number wrong, and there's a noxious beep and all that kind of thing. Um, and then there's a recovery period over, I think, an hour or so in our case. So uh, this is the study flow chart. Uh, basically just walked you through it. We had 76 people um, begin and they were randomized to the, the mindfulness or the waiting group. Um, and then we did the uh, post assessments. So what did we find? Well, I guess I'll, I'll give it away right now. The, um, there was no effect on the, the TRIER. Um, so the mindfulness training did not decrease people's reactivity to the stressful tasks or um, improve their recovery, which we thought it might actually just improve recovery. But what we did find was an effect on home blood pressure. So that's what we published back in 2012. Um, so what we ended up doing was dividing people into those who were prehypertensive, above 120 systolic blood pressure to start versus not prehypertensive. So this here is the two groups um, in the mindfulness or the wait list who had the higher blood pressure to begin with. And the solid line here is the wait list. So their blood pressure um, really didn't go down at all. But the people who did the mindfulness training, it did. So it went down into a you know, um, normal um, systolic blood pressure range. For those who didn't have elevated blood pressure in the beginning, it made no difference, not surprising. Okay, so that's it. And eight years later, I keep saying, so my student went on, she has a career now doing something else. Um, the data still from the Trier sat around, it sat around, file drawer problem. So finally this year I had a new postdoc and I said, I really think, and in the meantime, we were the first people to actually do the Trier with the mindfulness intervention, never published it. Other people published um, studies showing that the mindfulness training actually did decrease reactivity or recovery. So we finally published um, the null results. So no effect of MBCR on cardiovascular or cortisol reactivity. Um, and this sort of shows you, I think this is the, the heart rate, but it's the same pattern with the blood pressure. So there is a main effect of tasks, right? It, your heart rate goes up for math, even more for speech, that's standard. Um, there was a main effect of time. So um, the posts are all the dotted lines. So basically the second time you do it, it's not quite as stressful, but still stressful, but no effect of group by time by task. So, whether or not you participated in the mindfulness training had no effect on your um, reactivity or recovery in, in any of the, the cardiovascular measures. The pattern was interesting and different for cortisol. Um, so again, there was no effect of group or time, but also no effect of task. And so there was no um, spike uh, with the math task or the speech task like we saw with um, the, the cardiovascular recovery. And the only predictor of cortisol reactivity was months since cancer diagnosis across groups. So women who had been diagnosed earlier, who had been living with cancer longer, had more reactivity, which is the normal pattern you would see in healthy people. So what we saw from this is that these women with cancer, um, something perhaps had happened to their HPA system so that they were not mounting the typical cortisol stress response. Um, so we did finally publish that, and that's consistent with some other results. The summary from MASTER is that we see a decrease in systolic blood pressure over the course of MBCR, only in those women with elevated, um, elevated pre-levels, but no effect of MBCR on acute heart rate, blood pressure, reactivity, or recovery compared to wait list, and blunted cortisol reactivity in cancer survivors associated with time since diagnosis no effect of the mindfulness on cortisol reactivity or recovery either. So that's that. I'm gonna move on to the next one called I Can Sleep. So here we're getting into comparative effectiveness. Actually, it's a non-inferiority trial. So I got tired of just wait lists, um, although we have done a few others, but in general, we know that mindfulness-based interventions are better than nothing for pretty much everything. That's done. Um, so the question now is how do mindfulness-based interventions or other mind-body therapies fare to one another, right? Or something else, medication, who knows, right? So here we tested the mindfulness program against the gold standard treatment for insomnia, um, CBTI, Cognitive Behavior Therapy for Insomnia. And it was a non-inferiority trial because we said, well, is mindfulness, you know, at least as good or not worse? Um, and maybe it has other benefits. So this was a PhD um, project for my student, Sheila Garland. 
And we randomly assigned people with clinical insomnia who were cancer survivors to the MBSR, the CBTI, both delivered in standard ways. And we assessed by actigra actigraphy, sleep diary, and questionnaires pre-post, and there was a three-month follow-up. And we defined our non-inferiority margin, how we would decide if mindfulness was inferior to CBT. And we did a little interesting methodological thing that I'm happy to talk about, you may or may not ever want to do this, is blind patients to study conditions. So we did not tell them what the two treatments for insomnia were. We said they were behavioral treatments to, for insomnia that may involve things like monitoring your sleep, uh, filling out uh, questionnaires, um, relaxation, things like that. So even when they were assigned to the CPTI or the MBSR and CR, they didn't actually know what the other condition was, and they didn't know what they were signing up for. Come back to that. So our outcome measures, um, we had a, a range of different ways to measure sleep. So um, our primary objective outcome measure was actigraphy. Our primary Self-report measure was the insomnia severity index and a number of secondary measures we'd used in MBCR previously that we knew um, it had a, a benefit on. So this is what the study should have looked like, your typical consort diagram. We were going to um, start with, oh, what were the numbers? About 70, 80 patients in each group, um, you know, may, may retain about 90% of them or 80% at the three-month follow-up. So this is what really happened. <laughs> And going back to the blinded issue, so that we started with 111 people and we were randomly assigning them one to one, but then we noticed something as we were going along, which was this dropout rate. So we lost seven people from CBTI, but 32 from mindfulness. So 15% attrition versus 50% attrition as we were going through this trial. So people with insomnia, cancer survivors were not particularly happy to be assigned to a mindfulness and yoga group for their sleep. Um, and so, you know, there's a number of different potential reasons why. It's maybe not as obvious CBTI, if you've ever done it, it's very clearly related to sleep. It's pretty obvious. Um, mindfulness, perhaps not as much. And also you may not be able to see, but 27 people were ineligible because they had already taken the MBCR program. Um, so anyone, probably in that group who was interested in mindfulness had already done it. In the end, we were able to, you know, do our fancy stats and still analyze the study. Um, so this shows you a baseline. Uh, the groups were not different. Immediately post-program, CBTI was better for improving sleep, but at three months, um, it was, MB MBSR was not inferior to and this shows you the secondary symptoms. Um, these are not different. So both groups improved on stress and mood disturbance similarly. So here CBTI was more effective than MBSR in the short term, but in long term, in the long term, both treatments were effective and both improved stress and mood. And there was a number of interesting methodological issues from this trial. So um, what happens when you blind people to a behavioral treatment? Is it ethical? Is it practically possible? Um, what kind of conclusions can you make regarding generalizability, efficacy? Um, and then this, there's another theme that runs through this research around program preference and expectancy and treatment credibility. And we'll see it again. Now I'm switching to the mindset study. So again, in the same vein of doing comparative effectiveness, here um, we compared two empirically supported treatments for breast cancer survivors. There's a third arm included that was a control arm, uh, well, a minim minimal intervention arm that was later re-randomized. I'll show you the graph soon enough. We only included distressed participants, so they had to have four or higher on a distress thermometer, zero to 10. Let me tell you, that eliminates 70% of everyone who knocks on your door. We have both psychological and biological outcomes, and we did some moderator analysis to see if we could actually predict based on baseline characteristics who might respond better to which treatment, you know, kind of personalizing it. And we followed everybody up for a whole year. So it was the largest study of its kind. It was done in uh, two different sites, Calgary and Vancouver. And the other group was supportive expressive group therapy um, developed in California by uh, David Spiegel, Irvin Yalom in the 70s. And it's really about around emotional expression, mutual support, you know, talking about the hard things, um, fears of death and dying, um, and really detoxifying some of those difficult feelings around that and body image, et cetera. And this is an empirically supported treatment in and of itself. 
So we wanted to know what are the comparative changes pre to post among the three groups, that's including the control, on psychological outcome variables, on the biological variables, that question of moderation, what baseline factors were related to improvements in each of the two interventions, and then the long-term and one-year follow-up results. So these were the different psychological outcome measures, um, you know, mood and stress with similar measures we've been using, quality of life, and then also getting into these ideas around spirituality, benefit finding, and social support because the, the supportive expressive therapy really is uh, designed to elicit that, so we wanted to measure it. In this study, we did salivary cortisol, um, so three days of collection, four times a day. We added in telomere length for the first time, and we did cytokines, but I'm not going to tell you about the cytokines because the data uh, was unusable. We actually, for the first time, um, contracted out to a company that did multiplex analyses and the data came back just unusable and a waste of money. So I won't, I tell, again, could talk about that, but I won't be showing that data. Let's go to the first research question. So comparative changes pre to post on the psychological outcomes. So here's our lovely flow chart. Flow chart. So we're looking at this uh, piece of the study. So we started with 273 women. Um, and the randomization was twice as many to MBCR in support of expressive therapy. And so two to two to one. SMS is the stress management seminar, which is our control condition. So it's a one day, six hour seminar. These are our post numbers, altogether about 33% attrition. Not ideal, about 20% dropped out of the programs and the rest didn't um, complete the questionnaires. So we're just looking at this piece of the box for this analysis. And this just quickly summarizes the demographics. So the women were about 55, about two years post-diagnosis, uh, two thirds of them cohabiting married, 60% working full or part-time, about a third of them retired, three quarters with education beyond high school, um, and primarily stage one or two, so fairly early stage cancers. All right, so what do we find on our primary outcomes? So mindfulness is the blue group. Supportive expressive is the purple and our control group is the green. So what we found here was a greater improvement on mood disturbance in the mindfulness group. Um, and also in stress symptoms, although, you know, the effects aren't ginormous comparing the groups. And on the per protocol analysis, we saw that on quality of life. So the trend is always towards the mindfulness group being um, better. Um, and some improvements in the support group, more improvements in the mindfulness group and not much change in the stress. Okay, what about the biological variables? Um, so here, it, just a reminder of your healthy cortisol slope. So this is your healthy slope. It peaks just after you wake up. It decreases throughout the day. And it's uh, at the lowest just around the time you go to bed. So we can have unhealthy cortisol slopes that may be elevated, for example, in major depression or flattened out in things like PTSD or chronic stress. And why this is important in cancer, um, one of these, this is a real seminal study from David Spiegel's group where it, this was metastatic breast cancer, mind you, where they divided people into those who had steep cortisol slopes, that way, or flat cortisol slopes and looked at survival over a number of years. And it turned out that, um, for example, at four years out, um, people who had a steeper cortisol slope, 60% of them were still surviving, but only about 30% of the women who had the flatter slope. So this may be an important marker. What did we see here? Um, so this is not the slope itself. This is the change in slope, pre to post. So what you're seeing is the MBCR and uh, set groups are kind of uh, getting steeper slightly, whereas the stress management group, their slope is getting um, flatter. So that's the interaction here. Um, we looked at each time point. So there's morning, you know, midday, dinner time, and bedtime. And this is largely driven by a bedtime increase in cortisol in the control women. So that's showing it right there. Um, whereas bedtime cortisol, you know, was either staying the same or getting lower for the other women. All right, telomere length. So you may be aware that telomeres are like these little red things at the end of the chromosome. Um, they're protein complexes that, um, that divide with each, each cell division. They provide genomic stability. And so as the cells divide and age, um, the telomeres tend to get shorter. And that's a normal process. Um, when they get critically short or they dysfunction, it can result in DNA damage, cell death, and it can be a risk factor or a precursor to diseases like cancer. Um, shorter telomere, telomere length is associated with risk for other diseases as well, like cardiovascular disease and diabetes. 
And within cancer, shorter telomeres are associated with increased risk for developing different types of cancer and decreased survival in a number of observational studies. We also know that telomere length is, is associated with life stress. So it is affected by um, stress that people experience. So the seminal studies there from Alyssa Eppel uh, looking at um, caregivers of children with chronic illness who had shorter telomeres and higher levels of stress than age match controls. So what we did here, this was the first study that had actually looked at whether a short-term psychosocial intervention in mindfulness particularly, actually in supportive expressive therapy could influence telomere length in the short duration. So we only had data for the people in Calgary, 88 women, and um, we sent these off to our lab and they looked at the TS ratio. Um, and really what you just need to know here is that longer telomeres are better typically. Um, and what happened is that there was no differences between the mindfulness group and the support group. Um, so we lumped those together. So no, no sort of pre-post differences. So we lumped those together and we compared the treatment groups to the control women. So this is sort of the money slide. So the treatment groups are in yellow. At the beginning, there's no difference there um, between them and the controls and their telomere length. But here at the end, and this is just after three months, there's been a shortening of telomeres in the women in the control condition, the maintenance of telomere length for those women in the interventions. So, you know, this is very uh, preliminary finding. We don't know what it means, if it would have any effect on disease progression, if it's even something that lasts long term. You know, but the media loves this stuff. And this is just an example of there was like 300 some odd media stories on this. So yoga and mindfulness assess, assist breast cancer recovery at a cellular level. So that's Canadian national newspaper. Some of these world um, report type things talking about world's first evidence suggests that meditation ulcers cancer survivor cells. And this is my favorite from Scientific American, changing our DNA through mind control. Okay, I didn't know we were doing that. Media sometimes gets things wrong. Anyway, they were very interested in that finding. So the next piece in mindset was the baseline factors or the moderators. So these are all the different baseline measures. And specifically, we were curious, would emotional repression so, um, and emotional suppression. So re emotional repression is sort of subconsciously refusing to deal with difficult emotions. Emotional suppression is on purpose, saying, I don't want to go there. I don't want to think about this. And then we looked at all the personality factors on the NEO. So your, your um, uh, neuroticism, extroversion, conscientiousness, agreeableness, openness to experience, and also patient preferences, right? From the, the I can sleep trial, we knew that might be important too. Uh, so these were all the background moderators. To cut a long story short, none of them had any impact on who responded better to the mindfulness or the support group, um, except patient preferences. So let's look at that. So we asked them at baseline what group they were hoping to get. They didn't have a choice, they were randomized. But more of them wanted mindfulness. So 55% were hoping for the mindfulness group, 13% wanted the support group, 16% really just wanted the one day stress management seminar and some had no preference. So when you um, look at, you know, sort of shake it all down and look at who got what they wanted, um, only about 30% got what they wanted, whatever it was. So then you can take the 30% who got what they wanted and compare them to the 70% who got something else. And so there was an effective preference on stress symptoms. Uh, it's not a huge effect, but it's significant here. So people in their preferred program improve more. And you can see it better here in quality of life. So the, the women who got the intervention they wanted, whether it was the control group or whatever it was, it improved more in their, in, in their quality of life, in their preferred. So we hold on to that for later too. And then um, we asked, what are the long-term effects? So if we go back to our flow chart, the way we um, figured this out was after here, the people in the control group, after the first piece of the study, they were re-randomized into one of the two active groups. So you can combine these um, pre-measures with the pre-measures from the original two groups. Um, and these are your numbers. So that's your pre. Uh, 251, and then your post-intervention, and then everyone had six-month follow-up and 12-month follow-up. So we're missing a lot of data, but we just do our fancy stats here. And so at this point, we're only comparing the two active groups now, right? We've lost the control group. We've just got the mindfulness and the support groups. 
And here's what we see is that there's a pattern where both groups improved over time pre to post, but there was a larger improvement in the mindfulness group. And wherever people ended up post intervention, they basically stayed there for a year. So same with the symptoms of stress, more improvement in mindfulness, maintenance, quality of life, same thing. A little bit different for benefit finding. So there's more improvement in the mindfulness group pre to post, but then that, that gap continues to grow. So there's, um, and it makes sense because benefit finding is a process that takes, uh, takes time to kind of develop. So the people with the mindfulness training continue to find um, that post-traumatic growth. And then social support, which we thought should benefit the support group, um, again, increased more in the mindfulness group and dropped off a bit over time. Spirituality, same pattern. So more improvement in the mindfulness group. Um, you know, not a huge effect here, but still maintenance over time. So for the mindset study, to summarize that, the mindfulness group improved more on mood and stress pre-post relative to both control and support groups. They improved more on quality of life. Both intervention groups maintained steeper cortisol slopes and longer telomere length. Mindfulness was the preferred treatment, but only 31% patients got what they wanted. But women who got what they wanted improved more on stress and quality of life. And the MBCR participants maintained greater benefits over the 12 months. Okay, I know I'm just throwing studies at you willy nilly, but I'm trying to sort of give you an overall picture. So that leads us to the MATCH study. So we've published the protocol for this, but none of the data because we just finished collecting it. Now this is even a more crazily ambitious and I do not recommend anyone try this design. <clears throat> but again, um, we decided the mindfulness kind of came out on top in the, in the mindset study. So let's compare it with something else patients are really interested in, which in this case was Tai Chi Chi Gong. Um, but it's preference based. So we saw preference matters. So we decided in this case to give patients a choice. If they wanted mindfulness, they could take it. If they wanted Tai Chi, they could take it. If they had no preference, then they would be randomized. So, um, and in addition to all that, we included a, a randomized waitlist component in each part, and I'm gonna show you that. We did include only distressed participants, so there goes 70% of your interested people, and we just went down to a six month follow-up because the 12 month was hard to get that data. So here's the design for design geeks like me. Uh, all right, so we, you know, screen them and they're eligible, they consent. And then we ask if they have a preference. So did you have a preference for one group or the other or not? So that's the first division. And for people who have a preference, they're either in mindfulness or Tai Chi. And the people with no preference are randomized. So the R, mindfulness or Tai Chi. So there's B and there's R. The blue side's the preference side. And within each of these four groups, everyone is randomized to either get the program immediately or to wait. So there are waitlist control for, for four months. Then everyone's reassessed at three months later. So that's our post program or our post waiting period. Then everybody who's been waiting gets the program that they've either chosen or be randomized to. The people who've already had the program are followed up for six months. And the people in the waitlist are reassessed after the program, they get an extra assessment. And then they wait six months and everyone gets a follow-up at the end. So it's a whole year that people commit to this study. It's quite big and very complex. So we had aimed for 600 people. Um, we took it in the sort of pragmatic nature of the study. We took anybody, men, women, any type of diagnosis, completed treatment, any kind of treatment. But we did keep that distress cut off because um, we know very well that you're much more likely to see improvements if there's um, a problem in the first place. Widen the range of outcomes. So the usual mood stress, quality of life, positive outcomes. Added in physical measures that are typical in Tai Chi studies like um, balance, um, fitness, strength. Um, expanded biological markers. So we again have salivary cortisol. Went back to the lab for cytokines, uh, you know, the university lab doing a much better job. We're doing telomere length again. We added in gene expression with Steve Cole uh, down there and um, expanded our psychophysiology a little bit. And we added in health economic measures. So we started in 2016 um, and it's in Calgary and Toronto and we're done. We finished just before the pandemic. Actually, we had groups running during the pandemic and they couldn't come in and do their bloods and whatnot. But we have, I think, 667 at baseline. 
I can't give you much data, but I can show you for the first half of people, you know, one of the questions we had going into this is how many would be willing to be randomized? You know, would everybody have a preference? I usually would ask an audience how, you know, how do you think it fell out? But I'm just going to show you. So three quarters had a preference. Um, a quarter were willing to be randomized. And what did they prefer? You know, do we know? Is it going to count even or does everyone want Tai Chi? Uh, luckily, it came out pretty even. So Tai Chi was a bit more preferred. And partly in Calgary, that's because Tai Chi was newer. Um, in Toronto, I think mindfulness was a bit more preferred. That's all I can tell you now. We are um, just compiling all the data and trying to make sense of it all and sending all the bloods to the lab. And so look out for um, studies or papers on the mindset or match studies soon. All right, I've got a few minutes left to talk about our current um, adaptations for wider implementation. Why do we want to do this? Because face-to-face -face participation is not possible or practical for many people, right? Not that many people live close to a tertiary cancer center, at least where I am from. It takes a lot more time to drive and park and participate. It's more costly for people to do it in person. And some of the symptoms and side effects we're trying to help people with are also um, things that make it hard to get to a group. Some patients may be immunosuppressed and need to avoid contact with others. And now, of course, COVID-19 restrictions and um, people's desire to stay away from other people and hospitals. <laughs> so actually, we started this way back in 20, 2013 was the protocol paper. I think we did the study in 2012. Um, this was our first online adaptation of, of MBCR. Um, it, so it was a randomized waitlist control trial. So new adaptation, new intervention, let's start with the waitlist. So it was a fairly small sample, but they all lived in remote and rural locations around our province. Really, we were asking feasibility questions. So would they actually do it? Would they attend? How would they experience it? And then looking at the questionnaires and the effect sizes, would they be similar to in person? So we did this with Steve Flowers, a lovely fellow in Northern California. Some of you may know him. He had a lot of experience at the time with online groups. And so he ran it, ran it through the, a platform, um, you know, where you could see everybody, hear everybody, and also um, share visuals that we're all kind of familiar with now. But at the time, it was fairly, it was fairly revolutionary, I would say. Um, so that's Steve leading some of the mindfulness exercises. Um, so this is our flow chart. I'm not going to go through it in too much detail, but this actually shows you our feasibility targets. So the first one was um, how many we could uh, screen, and we met that target. Um, the target for uh, eligibility. Again, we screened for distress in this study. So um, we were targeting 30% and we got 37% who met the eligibility. How many consented? 93% uh, consented. And then we randomized them and we were targeting 85% follow up. We got about that. Um, and then uh, after the waitlist did it, um, we were targeting 85% of them. So we met all our feasibility targets were highly satisfied. So um, in fact, more than half of them were positively surprised and that it exceeded their expectations. For the rest, it met them and they would largely recommend it to others. These are the questionnaires. And so we saw similar patterns and in fact, similar effect sizes to in-person. This here, the first one is the total mood disturbance in the mindfulness group. The immediate group is the solid line. So decrease in mood disturbance, <coughs> decreases in stress, Improvements in uh, facets of mindfulness. Um, oh wait, that's the, the spirituality and uh, mindfulness facets. So from the patients, you know, uh, we heard that it was quite positive. And this person, you know, talked about how it was nice not to have to go to an inner uh, to, to a treatment. They could conserve their energy strictly for the course and content. And setting it up at home made it easier on non-course days to keep up with the program and the practices. Um, here's someone who was on treatment, so they really used it every day on, on the radiation treatment table and just become aware of their surroundings, so how it helped them in a practical way during the treatment. I like this one because um, we actually got more male participants in the online program, and I'm, uh, this was one of our, our guys who says, I was hesitant, I'm not a touchy-feely type of person, I had reservations about yoga and meditation, although, and, you know, very little actual experience. Um, but he says, I found that I really enjoyed the sessions and in many aspects, they were a highlight of my week. So that really made my day to hear that kind of thing. Um, and someone from a small town, you know, there's concerns about going to a therapist in a small town because, you know, talk gets around. And so they said, you know, the fact that the group was from all over Alberta, we would unlikely run into each other was a 
positive thing. I didn't have to worry about someone in the group talking to other people. So that's another benefit for people who live in small towns or rural areas. And then we wondered about, could you actually foster the sense of connection and closeness? And you know, people said it did work for them. Um, the online format held just the right amount of contact and closeness for me to be comfortable. So in summary, um, it was feasible, it was acceptable to patients, they were highly satisfied. Um, there were similar improvements in mood and stress symptoms and greater improvements in spirituality and the mindful, uh, the facet of acting with awareness from the FFMQ. So after that, we partnered with the company um, who was providing the platform, mindful.com, and um, actually wrote a program for them on cancer recovery um, that they offer commercially um, now. Uh, you know, through their platforms that's available. And we're also doing research with that platform now through um, eMindful and through their, their facilitators running our, our um, program, our treatment manual. And so the one study we're doing now, One Mind, is to see if online mindfulness can prevent, diminish, or delay the onset of chemotherapy-related side effects. Because basically we know that um, mostly in cancer survivors, the program can help alleviate those symptoms, but often they've been living with them for months or years by that time. So could we actually prevent them from getting so bad? So it's a wait list RCT to the online mindfulness either during chemotherapy or after chemotherapy. So there's a six month um, kind of wait. And the program is now 12, 55 minute live sessions. Um, so they're shorter sessions. They're spread out over the course for most people of chemotherapy over um, three months. And they do daily home practice. They practice during their chemotherapy. And we're targeting our primary outcome is the primary symptom or problem related to chemotherapy, which is fatigue, and then other side effects like nausea, vomiting, sleep, stress, mood. And we've been doing this for a couple of years now, and it's the pandemic has made it hard going um, for recruitment because we can't be in there, but we're more than halfway done. So I can't tell you anything about how that's worked yet either. All right, last study. So now we're getting into the app space. Um, you know, we know that apps are popular. It's an innovative delivery method. It overcomes almost all the barriers to in-person. So even online mindfulness that's interactive and synchronous requires people to show up somewhere at a certain time. Right? This one is completely self-driven. You know, many mindfulness apps exist, right? Headspace, Calm, 10% Happier, whatever you like. But really, um, there's more studies coming out now. But when we started this, there was really very little in the scientific literature about whether they actually help people and nothing specific for cancer survivors. So we partnered with um, a company called Mobio Interactive who already had an app called Am Mindfulness. Um, and it was a great app, it still is a great app, and had already been tested. Um, they were really interested in you know, investigating it scientifically and had done a study um, with the app in uh, university patients with, or university students with anxiety disorders. Um, and it already has a meditation audio library, and it has these things called journeys, which are sequential programs that are locked. Um, and so we turned our mindfulness-based cancer recovery program um, into a journey that we call the mindfulness-based cancer survivorship journey. And so we turned it into five modules. Michael Specka and I went into the studio. We recorded our usual dialogue and teaching around all the kind of topic focus discussions. You know, so what is mindfulness? Talk about mindful attitudes, the stress response, cognitive behavior therapy issues around thoughts, loving kindness. Um, and then there was guided meditations and exercises. And then um, the app company put it all together into this really cool um, journey. Um, so this is what it looks like. It's 27 audio tracks that are locked sequentially. I think it's something like 252 minutes of content. And we um, have asked people to do it in our pilot work over four weeks. Here's the little video.
Calgary uh, in the late 1990s and was familiar with the mindfulness-based stress reduction program from John Kabat-Zinn and had met him and been introduced to that model. And so um, Michael and a couple of other colleagues had already been applying their personal experience with yoga and meditation to help people with cancer. And so we put it all together into a more um, sort of standardized program and that's when we began our research and our first paper looking at mindfulness for cancer patients was published in the year 2000 and that was the first clinical application in the scientific literature ever that looked at the uh, value of the kind of intervention with these people. We have been teaching this group together um, for the last 20 years and so we're really happy now to be able to offer it in this sort of more portable mobile format. All right, so there's a little promotional blurb for, for that. And actually that, um, that app is available commercially too. And um, I have no conflict of interest because I get no royalties from them. So the objectives of the pilot study were, you know, we, we actually set it up as a, um, a small weightless controlled trial. In the end, it didn't quite work out and I can tell you more about that. But um, we had a range of outcomes. So we're focusing on stress, but also fear of cancer recurrence and um, some of the mechanistic things like uh, rumination, experiential avoidance, anxiety, depression, et cetera. Um, and then we also had these really neat measures from in-app measures, so patient engagement, um, there's sort of self-report questionnaires, and there's actually this cool biometrics that um, measures heart rate and respiratory rate within the app. So those are our sort of exploratory things. And so we recruited um, through, we have a registry of all the cancer patients in our province. So we sent out invitation letters, 1,500 of them. We managed to enroll 83 people fairly quickly. Um, and then we realized kind of right away that um, as people tried to, well, I'll tell you who we are. So 83 people, you know, wide age range, um, still mostly females, different types of cancer and about two years post-treatment. Um, then I'm gonna wrap this up in a second. But what ended up happening is that the immediate group where they went to use the app, there was too many glitches. They couldn't quite figure out how to download it from the app store. And so we ended up using um, the immediate group as kind of user testers and we did some qualitative stuff and we um, added in some tech support um, so that by the time the waitlist group came along, they were able to do it and more than 80% of them completed the program. And so this just shows the decrease in our primary outcome of stress symptoms. Um, so people who completed more than 50% of the content had an average um, improvement of a 0.5 effect size, so medium effect. Um, and so we're doing follow-up um, data collection on them and actually have submitted a grant to do this study. It's been approved through a national um, clinical trials consortium. So uh, if we get funding, we'll be looking at the app and can cancer patients all across Canada. All right, so I'm just going to do an overall summary and then we'll turn to questions. So we know mindfulness training is a good approach to address many problems specific to people with cancer. Uh, MBCR is an adaptation. Uh, yeah, it's effective for mood disturbance, stress, insomnia, et cetera. Um, we need to do more pragmatic clinical research to aid implementation and reaching underserved groups. And so online and mobile adaptations may be one solution um, to help more people receive this evidence-based type of treatments. Of course, it takes a village. So um, this is just some of the funders, some of the people, wonderful people I've worked with um, through the years on these various studies. Um, and then there's some contact information there where you can download our papers, um, follow me on Twitter, or um, send me an email. So I will stop it there. Thank you very much, Linda. This was a really great overview of so much work. Um, certainly uh, left me with quite a few curiosities and questions I want to uh, explore some, but first want to remind everyone so there's some outstanding chats and, and Q&A uh, questions, which I'll be getting to uh, just momentarily. Um, but for those who have questions and haven't yet put them, if you go down at the bottom of the Zoom screen and just kind of hover over the bottom or click around a little bit, there, you'll see a little Q&A um, uh, kind of symbol, and that's probably the easiest uh, way to get our attention so that we see your question and, and we can um, go ahead and ask it. Um, so I'm going to start with a, a few questions that have come in from the audience already, Linda. Um, one, of, uh, one of my colleagues in the Department of Psychiatry uh, is asking two related questions or, or actually kind of separate uh, uh, questions. One is, 
if you did have just one biological measure you wanted to uh, track, what would it be? And also um, whether you ha have compared any of the online versus in-person delivery effects to get a sense of whether it's a main Okay, I'm gonna answer the second question. I saw those and some smiling about the biological one. Um, we have not compared online versus in-person directly in the same study, and that's largely because um, we intend the online um, version to be for people who don't have access to the in-person. So doing a study like that would be near impossible. But I have collaborated on such a study with my colleagues in the Netherlands. Um, so they had three groups. Um, this is Compen et al. in uh, JCO, Journal of Clinical Oncology, a couple years ago came out. Um, and so they did randomly assign people to in-person versus online. Um, versus a, I think a wait list control um, and both were effective uh, similarly effective and I've seen that in some other studies as well you know you always think that the in-person is going to be more effective and um, many clinicians believe that but the research actually shows that the online is 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 similar uh, maybe not quite as good but you know in so in the, the compound study I was kind of mad as a consultant that they didn't directly they didn't power to compare head-on for a smaller effect size between the two active interventions. So they compared, um, you know, the online to, to wait list and the in-person to wait list, and they were both better, but they didn't directly compare them. I think if you look at the numbers, they look similar. Uh, yeah. I think there are other studies that have done that in other populations like, um, like Sona, Gian, and Zendel Siegel, I think have done that in depression, comparing online to in-person and seeing similarities as well. So that's that one. Um, so if I can only have one biological measure, geez. I've had difficulty with cytokines in cancer patients. So, I mean, it depends on your population too, right? Because uh, cancer treatments affect so many different things we might measure as biomarkers. Um, and then there's the question of what's really meaningful in a clinical context for your population, right? So it's easier if doing HIV AIDS, uh, you know, you can look at your T cells, right? And they're actually clinically meaningful. And, and they respond. Um, in cancer, it's really, really hard because say you do NK cells, like what does it mean anyway, right? Um, you can kind of make a multi-pronged approach saying, well, we know that, you know, um, if the intervention affects the NK cells, we know that NK cells, uh, you know, have some role in cancer development or progression, but it's not super clear cut. So I would almost like to measure um, the same kind of biomarkers that they actually, you know, that the the cancer biologists or the, the clinicians are using as markers of, um, of progression or like things that actually have prognostic value. So telomeres, for example, we don't know what it means. It's interesting to measure it, but we don't actually know what it means clinically. And the same thing for gene expression. I mean, it's super interesting, right, to show how these things, you know, going through your HPA axis or whatever's happening with the sympathetic nervous system, how it makes its way down. Like, it's cool. Um, but in terms of what actually has clinical significance I really haven't found anything that I I love to be honest <laughs> blood pressure is good because that is meaningful right in a cardiovascular context and so a lot of the, the cardiovascular studies that's what their primary outcome is so in some diseases it's easier right like the IBS stuff is kind of easier too because you can um, look specifically at the, the symptoms which respond to intervention um, yeah so I don't know if that's a great answer but I'm happy for follow-ups too it's a uh, it's it's a question that uh, I think a lot of folks who are doing this work at the interface of biology or neuroscience and mindfulness are continuing to struggle with. As we, um, you know, we have this kind of assumption that somehow one day we'll find some you know biological mechanism that is really integrally important, and um, so far. We haven't had a lot of luck with that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, I agree with that too. I mean, I think it's more, yeah, it would be nice to, if we could influence a marker that really is something that's related to disease progression or survival, that would be cool. Yeah. Yeah. Got a couple of, um, of questions through the chat feature, which I don't want to miss. So I'm going to um, bring that up just one second here. Well, I can answer one question I see uh, yeah. about how age might moderate response to mindfulness. You know, interestingly, we haven't looked at that, but I actually just put in a thing for a summer student this summer to look at that question in our data, because uh, you're interested in, um, you know, the more um, AYA groups, so adolescent young adult cancer survivors, which are defined as like 
39 and under. So he's going to compare the younger people who've been through the program with the older people, um, you know, and see if they do respond differently. So we actually don't know the answer to that yet, but we will. Yeah, um, I think it's worth noting that there's quite a lot of work now looking both at the very younger age of the uh, younger kind of end of the spectrum and the very older end of the spectrum and showing benefits in both, you know, children as well as older adults, even those with mild cognitive impairment. Um, but yeah, the comparative effect is something I've never seen. Uh, yeah, so it'd be interesting to see if there's different patterns or if younger people, you know, respond more on certain measures than older people, right? Yeah. So just sort of get specific around that. So in the chat feature, we uh, have a couple of questions um, regarding the, the training of the group leaders, which um, you mentioned has largely been you or you and Michael. Um, the comparison with MBCT that each trainer goes through MBSR, have a daily practice. Yeah. Is that similar to, um, I think kind of expanding the question, similar to what you've done with MBCR in the studies you mentioned, and also, you know, to what extent do other people uh, lead MBCR? Is that something that you're kind of um, training others to become MBCR oh, you know, leaders? This, yeah, yeah. This is something I get asked all the, okay, so in terms of the people who run our programs and how they're trained, um, yeah, so they have standard MBSR training, all of them, you know, so they've gone and done the Center for Mindfulness or whatever and be MBSR teachers and have a personal practice in their healthcare professionals, usually within cancer. And then we train them on top of that. First, they go as participant observers in our program, right? So they will, you know, participate and, um, uh, you know, observe the, the specific MBCR program, usually at least once. Um, and if they're serious about becoming co-facilitators, then they'll sort of ease into a co-facilitation role with one of the more experienced teachers and get supervision and feedback. And um, the people in Toronto for the match study, um, I trained, we trained them with videos. So they, instead of being participant observers in person, because, you know, it's once a week, right? And we weren't doing it online then, it was only in person. So we videoed the sessions and they watched the videotapes and then we had each week, um, you know, a supervision call where they would, we would walk them through what we were doing and why, and they would answer the questions. So that sort of training. Now I get asked all the time, can I get training in MBCR? I want to be, you know, and it's just not something that Michael and I decided years ago that we were not going to take the show on the road and do those kind of weekend trainings. And so instead we decided to go through eMindful and offer the program you know, that patients could access. So we wanted to in improve patient access to the program. So we wrote the book, which is a home study manual part with eMindful, so we could send people there. But we haven't done trainings for facilitators, you know, so, and I do the odd one. So usually in conjunction with conference or something, I'll do a day long or a weekend. Like I, actually the last trip I took was last January, the end of January to San Francisco. And I did um, two like grand rounds and then a day long workshop. Um, with a bunch of people from UCSF. That's the last time we've done it. So it, it's still something in the back of my mind maybe um, to do sometime, but that's sort of how we dealt with that issue. Great. Um, and, and kind of a related, where you put MBSR and some of uh, the, the term MBSR in some of your slides, what that really refers to is MBCR, this kind of slide. Yeah, word. you know, at the beginning right. we were just using it interchangeably. Right. I mean, you know, because in my mind, it's it's the same core principles, right? It, yeah. it, and the specific way, you know, the little things you do, I just don't think are as important as the big picture, right? So yes, MBCR is distinct and it has its own content, and but really the larger approach is the same as MBSR. Yeah. Or MBCT, really. And... Uh... Can you, can you discuss a little bit your findings around bedtime cortisol scores among the cancer survivors and why that effects stood out? Thoughts on its possible clinical relevance? And also from the same questioner. Oh, it's David um, Black. Hi, David. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the patient preference findings. Um, uh, just curious whether the, the finding there was related to classical psychological features such as loss aversion. Or is there something else at work? Yeah, so the patient, I'm going to answer that one first. The patient preference data is so interesting, right? Because you think you're doing a 
tightly controlled RCT, you know, where everyone's equal except what they get assigned to, except they're not, right? Because in this case, half the people wanted one intervention and only 20% or less wanted the other intervention. So you're going to have more disappointed people in one group. Maybe it's the disappointment that affects the outcome and not the actual intervention they got, right? And so this is controversial. You turn to the psychotherapy literature to look at this, right? Um, and there is lots of work in, say, depression treatment um, around patient preference. And in some studies, it's important. And in other studies, it's really not. Um, you know, so I think even the premise that, that patient preference matters is not uh, conclusively decided. And then if it does matter, why does it matter? Well, again, I don't think we know that either. Um, in our studies, yeah, I mean, people have different reasons why. And actually, we just have a qualitative study that's uh, in press right now with the match study participants, why we, where we asked them, actually, what drove your preference? Because, you, you know, they had preference. And a lot of people, it's um, misconceptions they had about the treatment they didn't want, or it's prior experience they had with the one they wanted or the one they didn't want. Um, you know, but a lot of times they were actually just wrong, you know, and, oh, I didn't want to do mindfulness because I think it's X, Y, Z or something, right? Uh, so, yeah, I, I think it's something we don't really understand very well um, at all yet, but it's very interesting and it really does throw a wrench, I think, into your, your thinking around a design. It's quite important. Uh, okay. The second question was around... The cortisol. The, the, well, I think... Resident meaning of the court uh, I guess it was yeah, yeah, yeah. different well I think we find when we look at, at, at lots of studies that look at slopes right um the reason the slopes are flatter is because of this bedtime elevation right it's not that they're not having the car the cortisol awakening response it's that it's it's staying high and it's not decreasing and so you want the nadir before bed and that seems to be more um predictive of other outcomes right clinical outcomes so that's why it was interesting to me to see that the people in the intervention study kind of had, you know, that lower cortisol at the bedtime, but the controls didn't. And, and also we know that cancer treatment and stress and all that can, you know, affect your HPA axis functioning and hence your cortisol slopes, right? So it sort of ties together some of those pieces. Um, but again, there's a lot we don't understand about, you know, what's the clinical meaningfulness of any of these measures anyway, because it's, it's a few steps away. Yeah. Uh, I, I'll just mention my one study where I included both inflammatory markers and, and uh, cortisol across taken across it. I think we had six time points. Was not specific to a, a quote unquote mindfulness uh, intervention. It was more of an intensive three month meditation and yoga practice uh, kind of retreat setting. Um, but there uh, we ended up finding not the effect on the evening cortisol. Some you might anticipate, you know, based on your findings, maybe a decrease of the evening cortisol um, that might affect the overall slope, increase the slope. But instead, just the very specific uh, awakening response, the, the one time point of the six that was changed was the one 30 minutes after awakening. Oh, and it was, so oh, and it was higher. Response. Yeah. But was Is so that the Shamasa project? No, this was a, oh, a project with an organization called Isha Yoga. Um, it's a whole story to say about that study, but uh, but that was the kind of practice involved, um, you know, a number of different meditation uh, yeah. practices, but some were more kind of open awareness and some a uh, fair amount of more concentrated. Yeah, so they would have had um, steeper slopes too, but because of a higher awakening yeah. response. Yeah, a, a slightly That's different. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and, and of course, with, when I did that, you know, there was there's quite a, a quite a range of findings out there in the cortisol and mindfulness and meditation literature. It's, it seems there's still not a great consensus. Although, um, what you're saying in terms of the impact on afternoon or evening cortisol seems to be the the most commonly found uh, kind of changeable. Uh, in relationship. I, I'm gonna. I, I, I'm looking at the questions here. There's one yeah, about go ahead. women. Um, that's a contentious issue too, right? Like I wrote a commentary not long ago. I, what was it? What did I call it? Wealthy white Western women, I think. <laughs> you know, just characterizing who. I mean, our whole body of knowledge around mindfulness-based interventions is what we know about wealthy white Western women. Right. Yes, right. Um, and so really there's very little diversity and our studies are no different, you know, 80% women, 75%, whatever it turns out to be, 
Um, and so we um, often aren't even able to do um, sex-based or gender-based comparisons. But in the grant I just wrote for the app study, I do think apps may have more appeal uh, for men. And so we've written in there um, that we're going to try and recruit like through testicular prostate cancer groups, um, you know, kind of where the men hang out and use more masculine messaging, you know, as kind of ways to try and get more men involved in these studies, because that's definitely you know, a drawback of the research to date, where they just, we don't know as much about how men respond. You know, they just, they just don't sign up for the groups. <laughs> yeah. Avnishi Ja will be speaking uh, next month for us, and she's probably got one of the MBAPs, largest, I know. <laughs> it looks largest like data sets <laughs> on men, because she's working with, you know, active military members. Um, yeah. But, you know, there's a whole lot of, uh, caveats about you know what motivates people to sign up versus uh, whether they're being required to sign up yeah if it's if it's not if it's not optional then then you get all the people which is <laughs> right. but you can only really do that in the military right? <laughs> um, one really practical question that's come up as well as a related uh, um, kind of cheerleading I think MBCR is awesome should be available worldwide accessible to all like MBSR it would be great if it could happen, maybe pre-recorded web training certification for facilitators. And then si similar related question, um, has the app worked out its kinks and is it called Mobio just in terms of practically, is that something? Oh, that uh, yeah, the app has worked out its kinks. Um, it is called, so the larger app is called Am Mindfulness. Mobio is the company, but you, you could find their website. But if you want the app, just type in Am Mindfulness and you'll see it. And then when once you're in it, um, our program is one of the journeys. So it's called Mindfulness-Based Cancer Survivorship. And it's one of these sequentially locked journey programs that you can go through. And I don't know if, I know they had made it sort of freely accessible during pandemic times. I, I think it might be a freemium sort of based thing where you get some features for free and then you got to pay a monthly subscription or something. I'm not sure how they're handling it. It's free for everybody in our studies. You know, that's one of the perks is they get it for a year. Great. Oh, here's a question that comes up often. So what are the effects of mindfulness on survival? The, the, the short answer is we don't know. We have absolutely no idea. Um, you know, the longer answer is that that research is extremely difficult to conduct and extremely expensive to do well and not high enough on my priority list to spend time pursuing, to be quite honest. I'm much more interested in improving people's quality of life, you know, so that they maybe, you know, it might not affect how long they live, but it affects how well they live. And so that's always been more of my focus. One question also, uh, are the effect sizes for non-distressed participants still significant? And I, you mentioned that that was really a, a, a barrier to participation for a lot of your studies that if they didn't have what was the, the cutoff of four on a scale of, of which scale was it? Yeah, so it's a zero to 10 scale. And um, only about 30% of people in this population will score, score four or higher. Yeah. So lots of research in the mindfulness sphere, not just in cancer, just it takes anybody, right? Oh, anyone wants to do it, come to our training. And then they don't find an, an improvement on the primary outcome of distress or whatever it is, because the people weren't distressed. It's a ceiling effect or a floor effect, however you want to call it, right? So, I mean, you wouldn't treat, I don't know, I mean, you wouldn't treat a, you know, give a depression treatment to a non-depressed person, right? You wouldn't give an antidepressant to someone who wasn't depressed, right? Um, it's not quite the same, but I think the idea is that if you're trying to treat a certain problem, a person has to have the problem before you can try and improve it. Um, so, yeah, there may be other kind of benefits that anyone can appreciate from doing these kind of programs, but, um, you know, they're potentially more esoteric or they're not the things we're measuring and, you know, so our model has always been to try and get the, the intervention to the people who can most benefit from it. Yeah, so you don't have a lot of data to compare those two things. I don't. Um, other people, lots of other studies just take anybody. Um, yeah. you know, and I mean, in our clinical programs, we take just anybody. And across the board, there's, you know, varying degrees of improvements people will report. Actually, a lot of our early studies weren't screened either. And there, you know, some studies we... Uh, didn't see effects on all the outcomes. Other studies we saw large effects, so it really varied a lot. 
One other, uh, I think, really important question that came up was in regards to trauma. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the growing awareness. Uh, I'm sure you know Willoughby Britton's work and other people. Um, you know, the the impact of mindfulness training on folks with trauma can sometimes actually be uh, untoward, and sometimes you know people, if not given some kind of sophistication or support, might not even notice that it's kind of uh, having an impact of kind of some subtle forms of dissociation. Um, you know, this is a claim that's out there, and, um, and yeah, then yeah, there's yeah. the more dramatic, so, you know, responses. Do you have any, I guess the, his question is, have you looked at it? Yes, so we are looking at it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, so in the MASH study, we, we included a measure of childhood trauma, actually, and um, so I have a student this year, that's her project, is to look to see if people with, you know, well, what, you know, what the effect is of the level of trauma a person's experienced on their response to the interventions specifically the mindfulness program. Um, but we have that measure in the MATCH study, so we will be able to, to see if it's a moderating factor, you know, empirically, right? And then clinically, that's something as a clinician, we're always aware of. We, you know, I had actually a few groups ago, um, a woman who was from um, Iran, I believe, and had a significant history of trauma and it was coming up in her practice, you know, it was, it was um, very, you know, salient to everybody, you know, that that was happening. You need to work with her in a different way, right? So we're always, you know, and then there's also the kind of the trauma of the cancer experience too, which comes back, you know, when a person does a body scan on an area that's undergone surgery. It's a very, very common um, experience in this group, not maybe trauma to the extent of, you know, dissociation that would, you know, last. Um, some people have these kind of periods of it, and it's something that we're, you know, it's trauma-informed. I mean, psychosocial oncology is trauma-informed therapy anyway, right? So it's something that, as clinicians, we're generally aware of, and when it does come up in the program, it's something that we um, discuss pretty openly. And this is the first time, though, that we've been measuring it in a study, so it'll be interesting to see if that even like what level of trauma we see in our participants, right? Like we have no idea because we never measured it before. So primarily you're uh, using some PTSD symptoms as a, as a pre and post kind of measurement or I, I didn't catch exactly how. No, we have a, a measure. It's the childhood trauma questionnaire. Okay. We use it baseline. And so we're using it as a moderator. Got it. Yeah. Have you, have you seen uh, issues with uh, some forms of dissociation, maybe not the more dramatic kind, but you know, people just becoming kind of strangers to themselves or you know, any kinds of, um, uh, you know, not just a, a, a rare occasion, but a kind of pattern of, of um, difficult experiences with engaging with mindfulness in the course? You uh, know, not... I mean, it, it, people have those episodes now and then, you know, they'll come back and say, oh, this weird freaky thing happened to me when I was meditating the other day, you know, and we discuss it and kind of normalize it because it's not that unusual. But I haven't had anyone, you know, sort of experiencing it to the extent that, um, you know, it, it was, wouldn't go away or that we can manage it or, you know, that they can understand it within the context of the practice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, great. We're coming up at, on one thirty now. So, uh, Linda, thank you once again for being with us today. And really, uh, as you can tell, our community is quite interested and engaged with this work you've been doing, and we really appreciate your sharing with us. Um, for those of you who might want to tune into our next talks, we're having one on March 1st uh, on uh, using mindfulness in the inpatient setting for adolescents, adolescent inpatient psychiatric populations and also specifically looking at trauma there. Uh, that's Zlatina Kostova from uh, Columbia University. And on the 15th, we'll actually be having a presentation from uh, 15th of March uh, from Norman Rosenthal, who's doing work with trauma, uh, PTSD, and transcendental meditation. And he's gonna be speaking about the relationship between mindfulness and transcendental meditation and you know, we're just giving an opportunity for some discussion around the, the comparative effects of uh, these two really different types of practice and the ways in which they're similar and different. 
Well, there you go. So, so this community will be able to delve into the trauma space a lot more in depth in the next couple of times. <laughs> so thanks thank again. you for having me. That was fun. Great. Thank you. So long, everyone.